All right, hello everybody. How's it going out there? Up in the balcony, how's it going? You got beers up there, alcohol, anything? Or you just come on down, join the party, we got food. It's gonna be good times. Uh, John, uh, welcome to the sixth year of Arc Nights. Six years, dude. Cheers. Yep. It's been a good time. Uh, hopefully this goes well. Um, John, what's been your favorite part of the Ignite Talk so far? Oh, last year in London, they were off the chart, right? They were like, one after the other was better than the other. So I think it'll be the same today, honestly. All right. So please, everybody, uh, if we can get your uh, attention, get your food, get your drinks, settle down. Uh, all our speakers have worked very hard at this. So how many people here have been to an Ignite, uh, Lightning Talk, Ignite-style Lightning Talks before? Some? Half? Okay, good. So the rest of you are in for a, uh, for a treat. It's a very interesting format. It's, it's, uh, it's part presenting, part high, tightrope, high wire act. Uh, how it works is each speaker gets exactly five minutes, okay? And in that five minutes, they get 20 slides, and those 20 slides advance every 15 seconds. They can't touch the slides. They can't control the speed. They can't go backwards. Uh, they're on their own out here with a microphone and all of you, uh, all of you staring at them. So that's the, uh, the format. And uh, I want to thank Sonotype, who is paying for all the, uh, the, uh, the food and alcohol that you're in, in, enjoying. So let's give a round of applause for, uh, for Sonotype. I just want to say, Damon does all the work, and I get half the credit for all this work. So. Yeah, thank, thank, you, thank you, John. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's it. So our first speaker is going to be DJ from Sonotype. Uh, and after that, it's going to go one after the other. So please, if you can give him your attention, that would be uh, fantastic. And uh, here we go. Rock on, man. Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. I'm DJ. Woo! This is the, uh, the Canadian thing. So um, let's do this. Let's go. Go. Uh, imagine that you're a developer. And you've just finished a vulnerability. And you're pushing this to production. And the problem is, when you put it into your resource code repository, you're waiting. And you're waiting for a scan to complete from a vulnerability tool that has taken 10 hours, and it's only 10% done. So what do you do? Do you, <laughs> sorry, this is interesting. It's an unused tool. And this tool has been around for many, many years. The only problem is it's never been utilized in a DevOps pipeline. So this security control is new, it's in there, and there's no information about this. And when this fails, it's just another day in DevSecOps for any DevOps developer, where things are fine, things are operating just perfectly, and security comes in, jams the security control in, and everything goes to hell in a handbasket. After that, the developers and the product owners get together and they say, well, you know what, we can't get this product out to production. So we're going to remove the security control. And it's gone. The product goes out to production with vulnerabilities in it. And they don't tell the security organization, which is totally uncool. In fact, they don't tell us for a few days. So we have no vulnerability information coming in to our central security, uh, cybersecurity uh, group. Everyone thought that the security organization was not responsive, but there was only three of us, and we were relying on a 1,200-gallon high-test fuel bed taking a nap, apparently. We worked with the developers, and we made everything perform better. We increased the capacity of all the servers that were running this tool in an effort to, or an attempt to get rid of this clog and not do it again, but it didn't scale. We scaled this up to 40 instances in AWS, and it still wasn't big enough. And the problem was, this was just a tool that was never meant to be used for large enterprise applications. The problem, as well, was that the remediation that we did by expanding our infrastructure also cost more than licensing the tool itself. So we were in a situation where we had a tool, and things just didn't work with it. It was the wrong tool for the wrong job. This tool was originally purchased as an objective C scanner for mobile applications and for microservices. And it was a very interesting scenario when, <laughs> sorry, five minutes is uh, really interesting. Sorry, I had to have more beer here. But it's still wrong. False positives came out of this application. 
Uh, and was, developers were left with a huge backlog of issues to go through. As well, we didn't leave any information or documentation for the developers. So when the system went down, there was no assistance from anybody in the software security organization. The tool was put in, and it was just abandoned. It was just let go. So how do we stop this? Well, for subsequent applications, we decided that we were going to slow down. We're going to take a look at the security controls that we put into our pipelines and then look at them and see, are they introducing any unnecessary drag? And if our pro or is the product getting out to production sooner? Second, have an architecture. Have some kind of information that you have from the community. A reference architecture that tells you where things go in a pipeline, stages, optimization, and flow. And if we had done that, we could have identified different alternatives for increasing the performance of our system. We could have had our small applications going through a small pipeline and our big ones that were taking a long time running parallel and outside. Third, we didn't have a playbook, and so we decided to build one. Information about how to remediate vulnerabilities, how to d diagnose the performance of the system, and who to contact in the escalation path all the way to the vendor if something went wrong. Failure is inevitable. So we also came up with the solution where one team could break another team's build if it was stuck and have an error message fly back to the developer saying, your build is clogging our pipelines, it's out. So this is what I call DevSecOps sometimes. Um, because it's the same as DevOps, but when you're selecting a tool, make sure that you don't start a conversation. Actually, sorry, when you are <laughs> adopting DevOps and DevSecOps, don't have a conversation about tools. And if you're looking for any reference architectures or any assistance, shoot me an email and you'll get some architecture information. Thank you so much. Okay, go. All right, everybody, my name is Michael Winslow. If you look for me on the internet, you won't find me. You'll find the guy from Police Academy who makes all the noises. He's the more popular Michael Winslow. So if you want to keep in touch, please make sure you use my exact Twitter handle, Michael S. Winslow. Last year, I was on the same stage. Here's picture proof of it. And uh, by a round of applause, how many people saw that one last year? I had a great time, you guys were great, but to recap for the people who didn't see it, basically I started off telling a story about this guy, a friend of mine named uh, DJ Boo Boo, who started out as a DJ in Philadelphia, and then he used the skills that he learned as a DJ to become a developer, and then up to a lead developer, and then before you know it, he became a senior manager, and then, spoiler alert, at the very end, I admitted that I was actually DJ Boo Boo, and the house came down. All right, it was pretty awesome, uh, and thank you guys for all the energy that you gave me last time. That's the recap. I also mentioned that uh, the reason why I did keep it a secret for so long was because when you tell people that you're a DJ, they treat you different in a professional environment. Instead of handshakes, you get high fives, and then people yell down the hallway, yo, boo-boo, wiki, wiki, wiki. All right, so because of you guys, I'm no longer afraid of the wiki, wiki, wiki comment. As a matter of fact, I want to empower it. So every time you see this get ready right here, can you guys say wiki, wiki, wiki for me on the next screen? Wiki, 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 wiki. Allow me to reintroduce myself. <laughs> All right, so the last time I told you the story about DJ Boo Boo, now I want to get into the real guts of what I did as a software developer and how I created a software that did crossfading. By show of hands, how many people know exactly what a crossfade is? All right, awesome. So it is to make one sound be heard gradually as another disappears or becomes silent. Pretty simple. And to do this in code, you basically need four items. You need uh, two media player controls of some sort. We'll call them incoming and outgoing. You need a timer that fires multiple times per second. And you need a method that you can call that can turn volume up and volume down on those two, uh, on those two media controls. So that's it, right? That's all you need. Once you have that, you basically have the timer, call the method, and then slowly increase the volume of the incoming song and decrease the volume of the outgoing song. Was that simple, guys? Yeah. All right, well, let me show you something here. This 
is what the crowd looks like when you just messed up the damn crossfade, all right? And when you keep it as simple as just bring the volume up and take the volume down, this is the look you're gonna get. You were supposed to say, wiki, 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 I'm messing it up, it's my fault. So, we forgot the golden rule. With, <laughs> with great volume comes great responsibility. All right, so if you get out there and you're gonna be playing for a crowd, you need to know your music pretty well. And that was the problem that, that I had. I didn't know, I wasn't intimate enough with the music, okay? Oh, no, yeah. So basically what happens is, if you crossfade two songs together while you have two artists singing, we know from Kanye and Taylor that you can't have two artists speaking at the same time, all right? So that could really mess up a crossfade. All right, the other thing is you have to become more intimate with the individual tracks that you're mixing with. And it's gonna get a little bit more serious here, guys. Can't be all fun, right? We gotta learn something. At the beginning, all we know is the beginning of the end of the song. We need to have more information than that when you're dealing with MP3s and computers. At the beginning, you actually have a section that could be no music at all. And then you can have this section that's kind of like, there's no uh, singing, it's not the major part, but it's an intro. And then you have the same thing at the end of the song, which is there's no singing, it's just kind of the end of the song fading out. Now, if you can capture this information in metadata, you can find out when does the song start, when should you drop the old song completely, and when is it safe to start bringing in a new song. And then as you put that along a particular uh, timeline and enter in a second MP3 with the same information, you know when the song starts, you know when it's time to drop the other, and you know when that song ends, then all of a sudden you have enough information to basically be a little bit more playful with the music. And this section right here, where you can mix songs together, that's the crossfading sweet spot. So as long as you uh, can identify this section and you have the right metadata in your code, then you can cr uh, crossfade. Just give me one second, get ready. <laughs> All right, so now you have a crowd full of happy people because you crossfaded the correct way. You may never forget that woman that looked at you in the beginning, but that's why we continuously improve, right? And so congratulations to you guys and me. You guys helped me uh, co code your first crossfade. All right, thanks, guys. <laughs> wiki, wiki, wiki. That's breaking a leg, folks. You good? All right. Yeah. Hi. Let's roll that beautiful bean footage. Go. I thought they would pick up on that. Sorry. Hi, I'm Josh. And I want to tell you, I love this community and I love this conference because everybody here, it's, it's in the title. We're going to get together and we're going to go together. But that's not what's happened I see frequently outside. There's a lot of people out there that will like to tell people, that's not really DevOps. You don't understand what SRE means. Right? You, you, you think DevOps is just a title. That's not okay. You can't be doing that. Well, I talked to a lot of people, and one of the things I loved recently was, was this. Right? The definition of DevOps is going to continue to change because it's about the outcomes. Right? It's what we're doing at the end. It's not the methodology of how we get there, but a lot of people get wrapped up in the methodology. And in this, I'm so confused as to why people would shame other people and tell them that they're doing it wrong. Right? I think it's mostly a lack of empathy, but I think there's also this desire to show people the error of their ways because we like that. Right? And when you shame someone, some powerful things happen to a person. Right? They close off. They'll disconnect from their community. They'll stop sharing because there's a lack of trust, right? And this is common also with abuse, common outcomes. We're DevOps, right? It's not very DevOpsy to move people to be excluded from a community. We want to bring people into the community because we know as a community we're stronger, okay? So it's important when you see this to put a stop because if we're not doing it right, somebody else is going to step in who may not have the best motivation to help an organization or help a person along their journey. They may be motivated for their own gains. It's important for us to keep in mind also that this is really, really new, right? All of this started in large part because the emergence of mobile phones and the way that we want to connect with other people. We're only 10 years into this, six years into this event. And not everyone has been disrupted 
early enough to like needing to do this, right? It hasn't been a critical component of what they need to do. And the risks have been really low, right? Now they're just trying to modernize or there hasn't been a need to change. It's also important to keep in mind when we work with our fellow journeyers that the first steps are usually the hardest. If you wanna take up a new language or you wanna take up an instrument, that first step is always the most difficult. And trust me, not everybody's doing agile yet, right? Lots of people still taking first steps. And we also always think about this destination we have in our mind when we go on a journey of what it's gonna be when we get there. But there's so many unknowns there. So when you start on these journeys, you're already in a place of insecurity. So as journeyers, we need to embrace other people and be mindful of their journey. It's different. They have different customers, different application types. They may have different budget. They may have poor leadership. You've all had these conversations. Here, we need to have them outside. So make sure that you work to align your language and the outcomes, right? You wanna be talking on common ground. You wanna make sure that when you're listening and communicating back, you're communicating the same way. So I do this in a way uh, that I work with customers. Uh, I start with development, right? Development, they wanna go fast, right? They do not want to put a foot on the brake. They want to go as fast as they possibly can to get new features and new capabilities out to customers. Well, we need to remember our operations people. Very important. They're building out the platforms that support the underlying track, right? Without this, nobody's driving anywhere, right? The code just sits on the shelf. And they're often working with old stuff that wasn't meant for this and having to adapt it and trying to adapt the new stuff. Ah, uh, the fabled DevOps engineer. Lots of scorn around this one. The reality that I see is that these individuals are really good at taking the tool chain and all the things that help accelerate a developer, accelerate the race. They're, they're paving the track. And then we have our SREs. Our SREs are focused on making the driving experience safe. And when there is an accident, safely cleaning up the track, putting in new safeguards so that we can continue to go fast and not slow down, right? Because the objective is still to go fast. So this is not complex, complicated, it's not complex, right? It's just understanding the role and getting to those outcomes and aligning yourself. None of this is wrong. It's all part of DevOps. And it's really important for us to you know, look at people pragmatically and the work that they're doing. I love Kelsey Hightower, right? He talks a lot about complication and like, you know, we're doing this to ourselves. So rather than telling everybody that they have to keep changing and doing different things, look at the model of how their organization works. So go out there, practice empathy, respect the constraints of others, and be a journey guide. Talk about how you got to where you are. And remember, opinions are like noses. Everybody's got one, but you don't want to stick it, you get into it. I just messed that up, but that's okay, I'm done. Yeah. Okay, let's go. Good evening, everybody. I'm Nate Ashford, and this is my story. This is the story of how I changed the world, starting with my world. I am a lot of things, but basically, I like to make stuff that works, and I like to celebrate it with the awesome people who do it with me. And sometimes, we don't get to celebrate very often, and that's where transformation comes in. The first few times I was involved in a transformation, I was filled with this eager idealism that things are gonna be so much better and everyone is gonna win. I do still believe in the winning and the better, but it can get a little bit messy and I can't always save everyone, but I can help someone. And if I can make a difference in the life of one person, that can be enough. And there's only one person I can actually change. Me. Two years ago, I was a mess. I was not having the impact I wanted to have, despite working long hours. I had a vision for change, but it wasn't going anywhere. I was spinning my wheels, and the stress was eating me up, and I was eating to match. I peaked at 255 pounds. I loved martial arts, but I couldn't ever go to class because I was constantly injured. I was in pain, I was exhausted, I was depressed. I even hid behind the plant in the family photo. <laughs> Something had to change. But conveniently, I fancy myself a change agent. I help people change. I'm a people! 
So I took myself on as a client, and I started with what I know. Start with why. I want to live long enough to see my grandkids, and to see them grow up, and maybe even see their kids. Core values, I decided that I like vegetables. <laughs> make, the, make the work visible. I started tracking my calories, my water intake, my exercise, even my sleep. Measure what matters. I monitored the outcomes that I wanted in weight, body fat, muscle mass. I set a goal to lose a pound or two a week. I started with just taking a walk half hour at a time, then an hour, then longer. As the weight started to come off, I started to mix in some running and then more running. I started working fewer hours and putting more time into self-care, like a daily routine. I, in the morning, it was, I uh, planning and meditation in the evening reflection and journal writing I experimented adding and removing things from my routine as I figured out what worked and a year later I had lost a third of my body weight 85 pounds I was happy I was loving my work and after 13 years I finally got my black belt life was good although I did have a couple things I wanted to talk to my doctor about I put off the appointment until the day after my black belt test, so he couldn't tell me not to do it, and we did a simple little blood test. Chronic myelogenous leukemia. Those three words changed my life instantly and permanently. But had I not begun my transformation when I did, I would not have caught the signs, and I might not have found it in time. The questions in my head, will I live? Yes, thanks to powerful drugs taken every day from here on out. Will I lose everything I've worked for? For that, I need another principle. Error budgets, big ones. I can't do karate right now, and I can't run as often as I'd like to. Other things slip as well. I don't always have my A game, and that's okay. Will I live with purpose? This is my most recent one, and I choose yes. I choose a life that is about more than ma managing my symptoms and my side effects. Today, I'm about to celebrate my one-year cancerversary on Saturday. I do not have it all figured out. Thank you. But my error budgets are smaller. I keep trying, pressing forward, and occasionally panicking and pulling back. But I've learned this, my cancer is not a liability. It is an asset. I am a better person and a better coach because of it. It has taught me about myself, about empathy, about struggle, about limitations, about letting go. And today, I have more impact to create change in the lives of the people around me than I ever had in my previous life because I have changed. And transformation begins with me. Go. So where do all the women go? How do we grow diversity in IT? My name's Rosalind Radcliffe, and I'm a distinguished engineer in IBM, which means I've actually done pretty well with my career. I'm one of the top, I don't know, one or two percent in IBM technical career, so that's pretty good. I started in 1987 with a degree in computer science in a field in which it was well, male-dominated, but it was better than it was today. If I look at this picture, this picture does not have who the women are because they weren't seen as important. They were programming the machine, but they weren't seen as important in history, so they were left out. If we look at COBOL, the most used language to run business, Grace Hopper, who invented it, was not necessarily looked on as a very positive person back then. And if we look at the computers that we all learned about in Hidden Figures, they were the ones doing all the programming, but nobody really acknowledged them. So if we look at history, 
women did most of the programming, and then the 1980s happened. And these game machines came out, and all the boys played, and it became a boys game. And it became the boys working on the machines. And if we look at the statistics today, in 1985, 37% of graduates were women. In 2014, it was 17%. If we look at the statistics at girls in the field, it goes down. If we look at women quitting, it's higher than men by a long shot. They leave, why do they leave? Because it's a very male-dominated field. Do they leave because they're pushed out of doing the job? If you look at technical fields, men, women are more often pushed into project management or other leadership roles because we're really good at it, but we're also good at technology. So we have to change this trend. We have to change the trend by starting early. We have to encourage people all along the way. We have to provide the visible role models. We have to allow people to learn. We start with things like FIRST for inspiration and recognition of science and technology. It's a great program that starts in elementary school to help everyone of any type, female, male, learn. We've got girls that code that help show girls that they're just as capable at coding starting early on so they can learn, they can experience this, they can understand, they can be in the field and be able to take advantage of this. We need to recognize everyone and what they're doing in the industry, reward people. When we look at teams, recognize all of the people that are doing the work and recognize the females for what they're doing. One of the things that you'll notice is many females have different career paths because we get to be more flexible. <laughs> We have to be more flexible because we have more challenges. We also have different career paths. Everybody doesn't do it the same way, and we need to recognize that diversity is valuable in the career path. It's good to recognize that everybody's gonna learn things different ways. We have to grow and mature. We have to let people go and learn in the fields. We have to let them learn to experiment and play. And honestly, this doesn't actually matter whether or not you're female or not, but we have to have proper mentoring. We have to have proper support, making sure that we support each other in this process and provide the visibility that it's possible to stay in technology. We need to provide networks, events like this, worldwide networks of people learning to work together to show visible role models to working in the field. We need to celebrate this diversity. Everyone has skill. Everyone can contribute. And when you have a team that is diverse, you're going to do better. You're going to have more innovation. It's up to all of us to make a difference. What are you going to do? I work with FIRST, I work with a number of different things. We all need to do this to help grow diversity in our industry. Thank you. All right, let's do this. Hello, my name is Laura and I am in sales. Please don't leave, please. <laughs> professionally, I've been in sales for a number of years now. A prize goes out to somebody that can guess, but personally, I've been in sales my entire life. I would argue, in fact, that we are all in sales and it's the most unlikely suspects that have helped transform this world using their innate skills. Many of, us, many of them are among us today. Many of them were likely at this festival as well. Let's look at some examples. Where would we be if Microsoft wasn't invented? Or would we be here today? Possibly. World would look a little bit different. But instead, we also have 
Bill Gates and Paul Allen to thank for all of the coding that they did to sell to other companies um, with their passion and perseverance that helped birth Microsoft. Looking at another example, what about kids, children? They ask why all the time. It's their innate sense of curiosity and willingness to learn and their ability to influence and to sell us parents all the time. My kids, I'd argue that they're the best salespeople out there, but my daughter right now, it's what not to do in sales. She currently wants a tree house, but the fundamental problem is that we don't have a tree in our backyard. So the persistence is a little much. How many pairs of glasses would we be carrying right now if Ben Franklin didn't invent the bifocal? He saw a market need and took an opportunity and solved a problem. Same thing with the lightning rod. It's a modern convenience that we all enjoy today because we have electricity, lots of it, and it's wonderful. And it's through the perseverance that he kept trying and trying to create the electricity. So by now, you're probably wondering, what do Bill Gates, children, and Ben Franklin all have to do with sales? This is just a sampling of the billions of people in this world who are all out trying to innovate and to succeed and to uh, transform the world. They use their drive, their passion, their perseverance, and their persistence to understand what market needs are, the challenges out there, and to try and solve for them. They're listening and they're understanding. Without influence, it's hard to innovate. Without innovation, our world would look a lot different. So with innovation, that's one of the reasons why we're all here today, because we want to innovate, we want to transform. We want to make a difference. But as we know, in this DevOps world, this industry is constantly changing. It's hard to keep up. Uh, everything's moving at a lightning pace. And, but what isn't changing is the need to move faster and better. And when that happens, you can run into a lot of pitfalls, such as a fear of failure, fear of missing out, and the fear of the unknown. So I encourage you. How do we start learning? How do we take advantage of all of this knowledge out here? Because there's just not enough time in the day. Coming here is a great way to get started, to see what else is out there, uh, to start influencing uh, your leadership. So I may have sales in my title, and you all may not. But the reality is, is that we need each other in order to learn about the different offerings and how to succeed and how to transform so that we can go back and influence our leadership and transform. So for the industry out there, I encourage you to talk to salespeople, not to be sold, but to be educated. The good salespeople out there will educate you on their offerings and the different solutions that are out there so that you can make the best decision, even if it's not theirs. For salespeople out there, please seek to understand. Understand the needs, the need behind the need and the circumstances behind those needs because every situation is a little bit different. Back to the industry. Know you're all here to learn and then to take this information back to influence your leadership to help with these transformations. I encourage you to leverage your inner sales so that you can ask good questions and learn more because this is a partnership and it's not just about the technologies and making the transformation, it's about the journey. It's about the entire experience that you're having from start to finish because we're all in this transformation together. Thank you. And now for something completely different. I'm going to be giving the slowest lightning talk ever. Go. So this is, in emptiness, there is no software. Buddhist wisdom for DevOps. A lot of the best ideas are old. They're not new ideas. You thought you made everything up. You didn't. We've known this for a long time. So I'm a DevOps specialist. I've been in IT for 15 years. I also spent most of my 20s and 30s as a Buddhist monk. So I went deep on this topic and focused as my whole life on meditation, teaching, and so forth. So what did I learn? We experience a complex world, not news to you, right? Everything 
comes from causes and conditions. Things are changing all the time. Everything also depends on our subjective mind. The outer world is complex. The earth, nations, markets, businesses, teams, everything. So complex. We're dealing with all this complexity all the time, right? No surprise. You know this. But our inner world is complex. Look at all the emojis that we experience. We have perceptions. We have beliefs, memories, biases. We have our interactions with other people, our energy levels, physical bodies changing all the time. So life would be a lot simpler if we were a bacteria. Food, pain, good, bad, you know, simple life, go back to the basics. That's one option. But our other option, we deal with complexity by using concepts. And concepts are also known as mental model, right? So a mental model is uh, based on beliefs. It's not facts, it's just a model of what we know, and we project that on the outer world. We try to make sense through that model. We need to not mistake our concepts for reality. So we need to take a high-level view in different contexts. It means different things. Maybe it means value streams and so forth. But we need to look at what's actually going on and continually adjust. So what is our mental model of ourself? We are the center of the universe. That's obvious. But there is evidence to indicate that that is not the case. <laughs> Still research, but there's a good side of that. We're the hero of our own story. That's Joseph Campbell, same stock imagery that was used previously, you might have noticed. So that's the good version. So if we're the hero of our own story, how do we really make this whole story work? How do we win? So we live in a world of concepts, but our concepts obscure reality. We, we mistake our concepts for reality continually. We see things and we think that we know what's going on, but what's actually happening inside of us, for example, it's changing all the time. There's tons of different feelings, beliefs, perceptions happening. Our body is changing all the time, but it still kind of feels like us. That's the concept. It's me. So how can we act on the basis of our limited information? We have limited information about even who we are. Even though we're at the center, right, we, we barely even know this person. We're still getting to know ourselves. So we have limited information even about ourself. So what do we do? Be open. So clarity, just seeing, understanding what's actually going on. Being open gives us perspective. And so we need to observe before we act. This advice applies all over. And then be kind. So be open, be kind. So empathy improves our judgment, gives us different perspectives. We can, in every action, we can try to act to maximize the benefit to others, as opposed to maximizing the benefit to ourselves. Simple rule. So we can ask ourselves, what are we thinking and feeling right now? Maybe it's good, maybe it's bad. This is what you need to ask yourself. This is the exercise. This is the slow part of the talk. <laughs> and it's gonna get very slow. So how does it feel? when you breathe in. Then how does it feel when you breathe out? And how does it feel when you breathe in? Because it's actually the feeling of being alive, right? And there's a feeling to it. It feels nervous when you're up here. I don't know how it feels when you're down there. <laughs> Clarity and, and empathy brings peace of mind no matter what's going on. So our clarity and empathy will bring us peace of mind in any situation. So I offer this for your reflection. Thank you. Right, let's hit it. <laughs> that is not my slide. <laughs> I 
It's the one called this. There we go. All right, everybody. We're going to have a frank talk about the no word. We're going to have a discussion on it, actually. Because when we spend a lot of time saying yes, we overload ourselves, we overload our teams, we overload the family, the dog, you name it. And we don't get the things that are really important to do. Uh, but it's hard to say no. So my husband got me this hat, and I thought, oh, nice. And then I wondered, did he get me this so that he could borrow it when I asked him to make these long lists of things to do? Yeah, it's hard for him to say no, right? It's uncomfortable for us to say no. We're not used to saying it. But saying no does not make you an arse, right? Sometimes it's needed. So we're going to practice seven ways to get your no skills on. Number seven. Your colleague asks you to, for help to fix the printer. Your response? No. Yeah. You could say, you know, I'm really busy right now. There are some instructions for the printer. See if you can figure that out. You know, beware of allowing yourself to be pegged as the fixer person, right? And don't assume that what your colleagues are doing is more important than what you're doing. Number six. Uh, Brett resigns, and the boss asks you to cover his workload just until the new hire starts. Your response? No. Ah, you could say, I'm so honored that you would consider me for this position. Uh, I'm going to have to get back to you uh, after I talk with the team. You know, sometimes you just have to stall to the least responsible moment. <laughs> um, all right, number five. Boss man has asked you to work on Project Sally. Your response? No. Ah, it's hard to say no to the boss, particularly when they make you an offer you cannot refuse. <laughs> but it, you know, it could be, you be careful with this, because you may not want to be involved with Project Sally. Maybe it's just not in your cards, right? You may need to uh, think about it. So you can. Uh, head, you know, if you hedge a no, you can buy some time. Number four, do you have a minute? Your response? No. Yeah, sorry, mate. You know, nothing really ever takes just a minute. <laughs> uh, and if you can remember your mornings, the first thing in the day is to get your most important work done, right? If you continue to say less, yes and let people interrupt you, your whole day could be shot with you know, five-minute interruptions. Number three, your colleague notices that you're headed out to lunch and asks you if you could pick them up some aspirin and some black socks. Your response? No. Yeah. yeah, no, sorry, no. In some cases, it's just best not to elaborate, right? I mean, keep in mind that no, is actually a complete sentence. Right? Uh, you just need to do that. OK, number two, uh, your friend from out of town has arrived for the week. They think you have all week to spend with them. Right? Your response? Yeah, it's like, oh, I am so excited to see you, but I'm just impossibly busy this week. Right? Remember, we can have many high priorities but we can only have one top priority. And if we decide to say yes to something else, we're gonna delay our top high priority. Number one, can you do a favor for me? Can you cover the Atlanta meeting? Your response? No. Uh, yeah, with this one, consider the trade-offs. Because it could be that, you know, maybe if you cover the Atlanta meeting, then you can ask them if, to cover your Cleveland meeting for you. Remember that WIP, work in progress, is a leading indicator, right? The single most important factor that affects wait time is capacity utilization. So have a think, just consider Warren's message here, right? Because your response of no, anybody asking you to do something, if it's not in line with your goals, then no is an honorable response, right? Um, because if you're going to get the work of your life done, then you need to allocate time to do so. Right? You have to ruthlessly protect your time so that you can liberate yourself. So what are you going to say no to today? Thank you.
special about Dave. So before I start, John Smart just asked me, is your talk funny? And I said, no. <laughs> I have 19 slides on vegetables, but we'll go ahead and start. So our delivery teams at Columbia are, have always been uh, pretty autonomous. And so when we designed our pipelines, we wanted to honor that autonomy, create the experience of full ownership, as well as uh, give them the opportunity to customize for their own needs. <laughs> and in the ideal case, I don't think my slides are moving. In the ideal case, um, the teams there you go. In the ideal case, uh, the teams are stewards of that responsibility and freedom, and they actually uh, do the right thing. But the reality is that sometimes those teams will optimize for their own incentives, or maybe even uh, for their own delivery. And that certainly isn't the enterprise uh, best ideal. Okay. We've been heavily inspired and influenced by uh, Topo Pal and Capital One. Uh, if you haven't checked out the software uh, clean room, it is amazing. It has a lot of focus and rigor on attestations, uh, artifacts, and, uh, and really limiting access to production, which I think is pretty awesome. But we've taken that uh, point of view and we've actually engineered it into our pipelines so that we're enforcing those uh, foundational gates that will we get to better outcomes, less variation, and ultimately more reliability in our pipelines. And as an aside, it helps us to, uh, to troubleshoot those pipelines because they have a lot of um, uh, commonality in them. And so pipeline templates and uh, containerized pipeline services have been a huge unlock for us. It helps us to drive a lot of repeatability. And the fact is we have hundreds of function apps that are all using a centrally managed, controlled, version controlled uh, uh, template, which gives us a lot of uh, repeatability. And the fact is, we're trying to make doing the right things easier than anything else. And so that really starts with better defaults, whether it's encryption, whether it's application settings, uh, service bus integrations, et cetera. We want to get to this point, which is kind of nirvana, but we want to get to automatic compliance or continuous compliance that John Rez was talking about yesterday. I think we missed a slide. I'll keep going. Uh, Okay, so we want to reward teams for uh, doing the right things. And so uh, fundamentally, that you, you know you have these teams in your environments, the teams that can make high confidence changes at speed without impacting other teams. We want to reward that and, uh, and be a lot more on the carrot side than on the stick side, but with guardrails. Our InfoSec and change management teams, they've been wonderful partners on this journey, and they've been experimenting, developing, and testing new ways to have uh, lighter weight um, governance into the pipeline. And I'm going to share four examples. Because everything is templated, uh, our InfoSec team can all of a sudden now own services that matter to them, things like credential scanning. And that gives them a lot of uh, uh, autonomy and uh, drive to actually own those processes. Another example are code scans for vulnerability or bugs. And so this not only has the effect of giving feedback to those teams that need to improve their practices, but it really uh, elevates the InfoSec team to be first class citizens within the pipeline. And they actually have, uh, within the value stream, and they actually have a control plane to, to drive the things that are important to their objectives. And chaos squirrel. Our uh, delivery, or excuse me, our uh, developer tools team wrote this to drive better governance within our cloud environments. We can run it in either a what-if mode or in a destructive mode, and uh, it's driving a lot of uh, great things. I have stickers, by the way. I was lucky enough to work on a team uh, in the spring about fixing change management and fixing the cab specifically. We came up with a lot of ideas. It's free, the document, so you should download it. And we talked about having a chain service that really exposes um, a chain service that could run in a pipeline. And so, uh, in our example, we've optimized that change service for standard change. And so that really means that teams are pre-authorized to, to run at their own speed because they've demonstrated the rigor. And that's really continuous deployment uh, at the best case. It can run in either a build or release uh, context. And um, as an example, our platform engineering team, they typically use a lot of uh, pull requests and merge requests for um, self-service, and those run on builds, and we want to capture that into our uh, change management system. 
And so within the CMDB, you'll see uh, CIs either at the team, repo, or, or pipeline, and they all have different reasons for being there. But the, the, the key thing is if you apply the SRE error budgets, you can apply it to this domain, and this is really uh, change error budgets and teams that actually uh, start to degrade, you can degrade their pre-authorization. So if you have a pre-authorized change that goes automatically within the pipeline, you get your corresponding record in your change management system, life is good. On the other hand, if your, uh, if your change surface area is rather large or if your team that's developing, that would be categorized as a normal change. We're going to block that deployment to production, and we're going to invite you to have a conversation with people that care about the outcome. So after your approval, whether it's a, a BCAB or a virtual CAB, maybe a show of hands or an ad hoc CAB, uh, and you uh, secure your approval, you can re-trigger that pipeline to go through. And so regardless of whether we're talking about standard change or normal change, we're linking the artifact that was actually produced in the pipeline to the change record. So you're getting the attestation, you're getting the, the audit trail, if you will, that make auditors and stakeholders happy. I think pipelines are a team sport, and this is an opportunity to bring your governance folks into the conversation to help them to, um, to drive behaviors and uh, start to own some of those artifacts. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Thank you. Okay, let's go. My dear DevOps Enterprise Summit family, welcome to your training. This is your playbook for a DevOps Agile digital cloud transformation. No prior experience necessary. Today, you will become a certified, really agile practitioners. Crap. The one best way, best practice, cookie cutter, 17-step program to digital nirvana. <laughs> Snake oil, here we come. Step number one, run a digital transformation project with a start date and an end date, 18-month countdown, 500 days, beautiful Gantt chart. As per the scriptures, thou shalt run and adopt the Spitify model, squads, tribes, chapters, and guilds. And you will all do synchronized Nordic skiing, whether you want to or not. Step number three, you will use milestones. You will predict output at the point of knowing the least. It's a motivational tool for performance. Funnily enough, five miles from Rothersay is a place called Stuck. True story. Step number four, language is important. The word deadline and drop dead date force agile behavior. Have 5,000 deadlines. The origin of the word deadline is Camp Sumter in the US Civil War, where you were shot if you walked past a railing. Motivational tool for performance. Step number five, human resources exercise part one. Let all your project managers go as they will no longer be needed. Step number six, human resources exercise part two. Create new agile and DevOps roles. The human resources will reapply for them. Not everybody can make the cut. Only the managers can determine who can. <laughs> Tool for motivation. Number seven, impose squads, tribes, chapters, and guilds. Take your existing org chart and don't change it at all. <laughs> Protect the existing Protect your existing fiefdoms. Step number eight, ensure tribes are aligned to job role. There's dev, there's ops, there's DevOps. There's computer says no. There's the pixie whisperers and the land of pixies and fairy dust. Make sure you keep those tribes together and then have tribal incentivization. You promote the top 10%, you give 90% of the bonus to the top 10% and you fire the bottom 10%, but only within the job role. We're not optimizing for value or flow here. Then you do agile project management. You take your Gantt chart and you use the word sprint 10 times in the middle. <laughs> you do big, big upfront design, buffed, big upfront risks, buffer. Those are not dating apps. And then you have learning and value at the end. Step number 11, compliance over risk. If in doubt, just say no. Or get someone else to say yes. <laughs> Maximum possible compliance, hashtag MPC. Step number 12, make cloud fit your existing controls. 
take your 1950s tractor of an organization, apply the Formula One engine, and throttle it back to 15 miles an hour. <laughs> Disable 95% of the features of the cloud. Step number 13, create a digital factory. Party like it's 1911. Because, of course, factory is a perfect analogy for complex adaptive change. And failure will not be tolerated. Don't you dare experiment. Number 14, create OKRs, which, of course, stands for output and key results. Your bonus is tied to exceeding your output and key results. There's RAG reporting. It's a motivational tool for performance. Step number 15, have metrics, target them, and drive competition across your teams. Specifically, velocity, say-do ratio, lines of code, and individual developer productivity algorithms so that you can fire your worst performers. Motivational tool for performance. Step number 16, have a maturity model. Contrary to popular belief, have level one to four so you know you've arrived. Set targets at each level. It's a motivational tool for performance. Step number 17, run mandatory crap training. Other certifications also available. Senior team enlightened ruler, crapster. Better off senior stakeholder, crap boss. And greatest official deity, crap god. <laughs> Renewable by attending a crap conference, reading a crap book, or watching a crap video. Congratulations, you are all certified, really agile practitioners. <laughs> hashtag, no, hashtag no change, hashtag as you were. Hashtag motivational tool for performance. All right, let's uh, keep it going for all of our speakers tonight. Thank you uh, very much. I think they want the music. And let's not forget that the food and drinks was bought by Sonotype. So can everybody say on the count of three, thank you, Sonotype? One, two, three. All right, now I want to reintroduce uh, Gene Kim and Jeff Gallimore with some special offers and messages. Hey, Simon. So how are those lightning talks? Yeah. I really did not want to follow John Smart, I got to tell you. That was awesome. That sucks. Oh my god, we're behind John Smart. <laughs> Thank you, John Smart. Far with that. <laughs> All right, we got a few announcements, updates, some information download for you. Uh, for those of you who are interested in the keynote videos, we've already got some of them flowing into the IT Revolution YouTube channel, so you can start to access those. But again, don't do it on the hotel Wi-Fi, because you're already here. Okay. All right. Um, in addition to that, I think Gene has some, some words. Yeah. Uh, thank you all so much for your help spreading the love about the Unicorn Project. Uh, to remind you, the whole reason why I even consider making a run at the bestseller list is so that... It's because I genuinely believe uh, that doing this will add credibility to our cause. The goal is to get this book to be shown alongside books that business leaders buy. The type twos, like Joe Aho that you saw on stage, our favorite CFO. And by the way, I, I do have to say, I do think it would be really funny for CFOs to be buying a book with the word unicorn in the title. I mean, come on, right? It's pretty funny. So on the next slide. Um, in the spirit of giving fast feedback on the results that your actions are doing, I want to show you this. Just a few hours ago, the Unicorn Project got the bestseller badge rating on Barnes & Noble. So if you zoom in. <laughs> so, you know, these things are transient, right? I mean, we've got a long way to go. Um, so many of you are getting the 25 book bundle, which we call the Bridge Crew Bundle. And so this is actually a particularly amazing value because if you add up the value of everything you receive, you'll discover that we're actually paying you to buy these books. Because everyone who orders the 25 book bundle also receives the entire collection of the IT Rev catalog um, and the 13 books that inspired me most while writing the Unicorn Project. In my opinion, uh, all kidding aside, I think these are the best books for technology leaders that were written by our generation. I mean, I think they are amazing books. Uh, but I do want to show you the math behind the offer. So here's, here's the math behind the offer, right? If you go to Barnes & Noble, you're paying $600 for 25 Unicorn Project books. But what you get is $570 of all these amazing other books, plus the entire IT Rev catalog. And you also get a $500 discount towards your next DevOps Enterprise Summit registration. 
So that's like $970 of value for $600. So here's kind of the embarrassing truth. We're actually paying you $370 to buy 25 copies of the Unicorn Project. So here's the reason why I'm a little bit conflicted about this. Because imagine how it feels to be an author where you're having to pay people to buy your books. <laughs> right? I'm actually not quite sure how I feel about that. But on the other hand, I think this demonstrates the level of commitment that we all have to making this bestseller vision a reality. So here's my really candid advice. If you plan on attending DevOps Enterprise Summit next year, and you like the books represented on this slide, take advantage of the offer, and just expense it. And you can even sell the Unicorn Project books on eBay and make a profit. <laughs> so with all that, thank you so much. I hope you had a great day today. And tomorrow, we have a great day of programming. It's going to be awesome. So I'll turn it over to Jeff. Yep, yep. So. So Gene and I were, were, were talking backstage, and we were talking about the, the deal. Um, let me share a little bit with, with you about why at least I'm so excited, and as I was sharing with Gene. So imagine walking into your CEO's office, or your CFO's office, or your CMO's office, and seeing a, con a copy of the Unicorn Project on their desk. Just hold that picture for a second. Now imagine the kind of conversation that you're going to be able to have with that person, with that executive, about the challenges that the organization is having, your role in helping address those challenges, and the impact that that could have on yourself, and your teams, and your colleagues. That's why we're doing this. That's the impact that we can have by getting this book onto the bestseller list. So, uh, so here's the hard close. Here's the hard close. What can I do to get you all into the sweet 25 book bundle today? <laughs> so all joking aside, the offer ends tomorrow at noon. You need to go to the Barnes & Noble website, pre-order the 25 copies of the Unicorn Project, and then send your receipt to Alex and his email address is listed uh, on the slide and it's also going to be in the Slack channel. Uh, thank you so much for, for doing this. If it weren't for all of you, the amazing DevOps Enterprise community, we wouldn't even have, have a shot at making this happen. So it's thanks to all of you that we can even make a run at this. Yes, you can applaud for yourselves. Yeah. So when you do that, the 23 books that we already have, those will ship out to you next week. And then the 25 copies of the Unicorn Project will ship after it's released on November 26th. Now, you have to wait for the Unicorn Project after it's released in November. But you don't have to wait for six different books that are being signed by their authors tonight, stationed around the Chelsea Theater. You can see all of the, the stations lit up. Go there, get your books, get them signed by the offers, and you will be able to take those home with you. So, final thought. Um, that's what we're trying to do with the, with the books, trying to get them uh, into the hands of business executives so that we can start to change the conversations that we're having. I hope you all have had an amazing time today. I hope you've had an amazing time at the lightning talks. I found them super entertaining. I hope you have a great rest of your evening and we will be back here tomorrow, bright and early tomorrow morning at 845 here in the Chelsea for the final day of the 2019 DevOps Enterprise Summit in Vegas.